Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another interview of Respect My Nerves. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy, Trayvon Copey. I know what time it is, bro. L.A.'s finest, baby. L.A., stand up. What? L.A., stand up. What? L.A., stand up. What? You know what I'm saying? We got Mr. David G. Brown, okay? Mr. David G. Brown. Say it with me. David G. Brown. Okay, one time. Yeah. David G. Brown. We got my man, <laughs> David G. Brown. His brother's an activist, cartoonist. Everything. He does everything. And he kisses the baby. Can, can you ask for a better specimen? No, you can't. You can't ask for a better specimen. You can't. And you won't. You will. Stab you. No, anyway. All right. Listen, y'all. Bro, this got a better, very, 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 very special brother. This man has been in the game for a long time. This man is educated. He's inspired and also enthused. Mr. David G. Brown, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good. And, you know, I appreciate this opportunity, brother. I believe it. <laughs> All right. So, Mr. David G. Brown, I know a lot about you, but for the fans, who is David G. Brown? Well, I'm an artist, educator, and publisher. And I do political cartoons. I'm one of the few African American political cartoonists in the country. Mm -hmm. I'm with the Los Angeles Sentinel, which is an African American newspaper. Mm -hmm. And we're the, the biggest, I mean, the longest. African American newspaper in the West, and next year we're going to be celebrating ninety years. Ninety years. How long? How long? I want you to say it again while I'm drinking. One, two, three. Say it again. <laughs> ninety years. The Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper has been around ninety years, and it's been, ninety. It's, okay. it's, the, it's the oldest. It's the oldest African American newspaper in the West. Ninety and, years. And so uh, to that point, it's just so very important that we have our own media and document our history and tell our own stories. I mean, let's face it, living in America, the, you know, education and what America is all about is dominated by the European culture. The dominating culture has, has dominated mm -hmm. this country. Mm -hmm. And even when you think about when you went to high school, you know, what did you learn about? Christopher Columbus, yeah. <laughs> England, the British. Yeah. And Greek. very little, uh, uh, very little about the African culture and our contribution to this country. Yeah. So I, I, I want to change that trajectory. So I am an artist, like I said. I'm also an educator. So I... I taught for the Los Angeles School District for over a decade. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm what they call a career technical education teacher. Mm -hmm. And I focused on art, media, and entertainment. In other words, I'm preparing students, and I'm specifically interested in students of color learning about the art, media, and entertainment industry. So that means television, movies, advertising, the web, graphic design. And these are areas that we haven't traditionally been a part of in the media. So besides that, uh, like I said, I'm a political cartoonist. I teach. I just recently retired from the school districts. And just recently, I'm chairman of the board of the Museum of African American Art. And again, art and our art is a way for us to document and also teach the next generation about, about us and our culture and so much that we have to be proud about. You're right. Amen. So, Amen. Let, so let, me just, let me just start a little bit about, you know, my, my, my journey, if that's okay. Is that okay, Trayvon? Okay. I was so, going to ask a question first and was going to lead into okay, oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, okay. Go ahead and ask me your question. <laughs> Fancy, <man. laughs> Mr. Brown. What got yes. you started in doing some of the things that you've just told us that you've been doing for so long? <laughs> okay, so um, let, let me start very early on. Um, I, you know, I, I love drawing. I had an older brother that was very talented, and he was my first mentor. Ooh. And so I knew art was going to be a part of my life, even if it wasn't, even if it was a hobby, <laughs> let me put it that mm -hmm. way. So, um, when I went to college, uh, I went to Stockton State College, which is in South Jersey. 
Okay. And it was a relatively new college. And I worked for the student newspaper. And so I became the, the first political cartoonist for mm. the student newspaper. And so mm. I would do I would do cartoons about you know, the, t- the tuition too damn high. <laughs> you know, the dorms are overcrowded. And, mm-hmm. and the school that I went to, it was a very liberal school. We did a lot of partying and what have you. But 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 it was great because that gave me a creative outlet for me to to do my art and activism. I mean, because I I was a big fan of the Black Panther Party and uh, civil rights. And so this was my way of voicing that voice, you know. So so from a very young age, you know, I was always like, you know, very interested in uh, being an activist and making change. Mm -hmm. And to that point, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about my family. So my dad was a cook. And what I learned from my dad is a strong work ethic. And I, I worked with my dad. And he he didn't understand why I wanted to leave that good job. His generation, you get a good job, you stay there for 30 years and you retire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he couldn't understand why I left that job for to, to go to college. But I, I I respect him because you know, in his world, in his generation, that's what it was all about. Now, my mother, she was an artist and she used to paint. As a matter of fact, there's a painting that she did when she was carrying me, and she always said that that, that kind of influenced me, you know. So, um, mm-hmm. and then I then I had uh, a, a brother older than me, and I mentioned him early. His name is Tony Brown, talented artist. And when I was as young as 11, 12 years old, we would do I was doing comic books. We would do little comic books, draw them, and all that kind of stuff. So, so let me get back to college. So. In my college years, I was the first cartoonist for the, the student newspaper. Mm-hmm. And so, so a lot of local businesses were interested in the students, you know, supporting their businesses. So um, eventually there was an opportunity for me to become the associate editor. So as associate editor, I became responsible for ads. So that really, so I learned how to create ads because I would draw the cartoons like for instance there was a local uh, pub bar that mm-hmm. they would want students to come to so maybe a student night right and so I would draw you know some drunk student or party students or what have you and so those were things that I that that would appeal and compel students to want to you know support you know that business so through that process of creating ads, I learned about advertising. So that was kind of the foundation for me, learning about how to do advertising. And as a matter of fact, part-time when I was in college, I worked for um, the uh, uh, agency that did the Yellow Pages. So mm-hmm. I don't know if you're old enough to remember the Yellow Pages, but they used to be the Yellow Pages that the they would book. give the people the big book, and they would have little ads in it. So that was the foundation for me learning about advertising. And then from then, so when I graduated from college, I worked for an advertising agency. I worked for an advertising agency in Philadelphia. And uh, it, it was neat. I mean, I loved it. I mean, I started at what they call paste up artists. And that's probably something that the next generation don't know what that is. But <laughs> there was a time before computers used to cut and paste, you know, uh, advertising. You know, mm-hmm. and then you would take it to the printer or what have you. So, so I, I worked for an uh, advertising agency, design studio in Philadelphia, and mm-hmm. I did that after after college. Uh, and then I went to the Philadelphia College of Art while I was there. But I found that I was limited. I mean, uh, because all the work environments I was in, I was the only brother, and so I would often be marginalized. Mr. Yes. What year was this? Okay, story? so I so. I'm giving my age away, but but I started college uh, in '73 at Stockton. I gra- at Stockton State College, okay. actually the Stockton University now, and then uh, I graduated in '78. Uh huh. And then I started working in advertising shortly after I graduated from there, mm-hmm. and then in the mid '80s, mm-hmm. 
I I moved from Philadelphia because I felt I was limited. There was only only one black advertising agency in the whole city of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And so Philadelphia, I don't know if you know much about Philadelphia, but it's a, one of those traditional, you know, pilgrims, you know, the Liberty Bell, uh, Benjamin Franklin, you know, Edgar Allan Poe. So You're talking about the white real. side. You're talking about the white that, side. Black side, did, did, yeah. did you see any concrete cowboys? I, I got to ask that real quick. Did you see any black people um, on horses? You, you, you know what? I didn't really run into much of that. You know, maybe outside of Philadelphia. Mm-mm, maybe you know, doing, uh, listen, I got a friend, like, we were talking uh, about it. We were talking about the concrete cowboys, and, and that there was like a very prestigious, uh, like ranch or something like that. Well, like, right, right, to Philly to, to now that was that was in, you know, you know, I believe that I just I just didn't really have any exposure to that, you know. And, oh. I mean, I, I, <laughs> and I, um, but there was a lot of horseback riding and stuff where I went to college at, too, because that was right outside of Atlantic City. And, they, you know, they was country. So you could go horseback hey, riding and all that. Were they black? Yeah. I'm were they, sorry? Were they black? No. No, they weren't black, though. I know. Next time you go to Philly, but, I'm going to take the black side. Yeah, let's do that. Are you, are you from Philly? No. No, no I, I just oh, – I got, I got oh. some good friends from Philly. I got some oh, okay. I, matter of fact, I was just in Philly. I mean, that, I mean, the Philly was just really the foundation for my career. Anyway, quick fast forward. Mid eighties, I moved to Los Angeles. Then I worked in animation. You know, I worked for a company called Filmation. They did um, uh, the Cosby Kids. Oh wow! They did. They did He Man. Oh wow! They did. Uh, what else did they do? Um, oh, but 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 it was it was like low budget. <laughs> it was like low budget. Uh, um, you know, animation. And so that kind of cut my teeth into the, learning about animation or what have you. Mm-hmm. And, but, but, and I primarily what I did, I did the storyboards. But most of the animation they sent overseas to, uh, <laughs> to uh, sent overseas. So anyway, okay. So then I, 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 got, I went back to advertising. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I was an art director for a marketing firm. Mm-hmm. So that was really cool. Oh, and oh, I oh, got, oh, uh, oh, yeah. Like, let me start uh, for a second. You worked on uh, a storyboard for He Man. Yeah, I, I worked for well, it was He Man, and there was the whole lineup of stuff that filmation did, and there was, there was also um, uh, the Cosby Kids. I'm trying to think. Uh, when you say the Cosby Masters Kids, of the, Fat Albert, or are you talking about uh, something else? The, 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 it, it, no, it was Fat Albert. Okay, you got you got to say Albert. Fat Albert, brother. I'm old. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Kids, yo. These kids are young. <laughs> okay, okay. See, I'm and then, and, and, then, and, and, and then I worked on this. Um, it was called the Brown Hornet, which was was, was Cosby's, uh, like a superhero that flew through space and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, Google it. It's called the Brown oh, Hornet right now. Um, okay, so I was working in advertising. I always had an interest in comic books, you know, because I told you when I was young. So what happened was. In 1992, do you remember what happened in L.A. in 1992? Of course I remember what happened in L.A. in 1992, because that was the year I was born. Clearly. (laughs) It was the L.A. riots. (laughs) Yes. The the Rodney King L.A. riots happened. So the city of Los Angeles, they have what they call the Cultural Affairs Department. And they were they, they they did a call for artists to get involved with healing the city. Mm-hmm. So they and they were giving out grants for artists. So I applied to do a book about a black superhero who arises from the ashes of the riots to heal the city. Symbolic of you know uh, the, the the phoenix. The Phoenix mm-hmm. rising and rebuilding, and it's called the LA Phoenix. And so that's that launched my LA Phoenix series. So I did a three book series on the LA Phoenix, a little bit about the LA Phoenix. So he deals with community issues, has all non lethal weapons. And issue number one was the anti graffiti book, issue number two was the anti gang. Issue number three was the anti-drug pro-educational thing. 
And it was really successful. It just blew up. I was on CNN. I was on all the local news and all that kind of stuff. So that was really cool. So from that, I started getting invited to talk to kids. And then I created an after-school program that was funded by the Cultural Affairs Department. Mm -hmm. And it was called Tales from the Kids. So Tales from the Kids was an after-school program where I did workshops with kids from the ages like 11 to like 17. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we created these comic books uh, with uh, positive messages, dealing with conflict resolution, uh, dealing with uh, reading and literacy, mm -hmm. and staying away from gangs and drugs. So, so, that, so I did that, and that was, that's, so I did about eight issues of the Tales from the Kids. So then in 2003, you know, based on my comic books, I got invited to be the political cartoonist for the Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and I've been there, next year it will be two decades, I've been producing political cartoons for the Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper. And, I, the, and the reason why I think it's really important, and I, and I really feel like I'm blessed that I have a platform to have a voice is that because the lion's share political cartoonists are white, middle-aged white men. What do they know about the black community? What do they know with the, about the black experience? So one of my goals as a cartoonist is to be able to enlighten and educate others, uh, including our community, about the issues that are important to our community and to us as a culture, okay. So I know I know I, I went on a little further than uh, <laughs> uh, I think you asked me how I got started, but that's that's kind of a, a synopsis of, of mm -hmm. my my journey. And then and then most recently, I'm at the Museum of African American Art. I hear that. That's amazing, man. No, like um, I, I wasn't as uh, educated on um, or as educated as I should have been uh, on your uh, your um. Your, your oh, no. oh, 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 no. Oh, look, hey, that's what this is all about. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm one of the few, like, for instance, I, I went to a conference over the weekend. And, okay, so we probably had about 100 attendees. Can you guess how many African-American political cartoonists were in attendance? Probably like four. Try two. That is that. And see, let me just stop you for a second. This sure, uh, sure. What I'm talking about when mm -hmm. reasons why I don't necessarily work for white people, I will work with white yeah. people. Um, because uh, there's still this profound blank racism that's right there in your face. You know, like I don't, I don't need you coming to try to save some kind of face when there's something political on the national stage going on, like a black man getting shot or um, some crazy ass white kid shooting up a school or a church and you want to save face and oh, put up Black Lives Matter signs and shit. Like, no, 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 no. If you're going to be, if, you, if you're going to ride and respect me, I need, I need more black people hired. Okay, I need more black people hired in all these spaces and all these non-white. You know, all these spaces that other people get away with are only hiring their race or their particular... Uh, well, well, let, let me just interject just, just for a second here. Ahead, so to your, point, to your point, you know, when I got my job as a art director, production manager for the marketing firm I worked for, that was the first time they had ever hired any African-Americans. I oh, hired was a black graphic designer. I hired a couple of illustrators and photographers. What what year but, was that? I, okay, that was the nine. That was in, in the early nineties, and that's when I, I first came to Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, so, but but I think that also when you think about it, most people are comfortable hiring people that they know <laughs> and that look like them. And, 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 and when I was teaching, especially preparing kids for the industry, one of the things that I really focused a lot on is building relationships and networking. 
So that's so that's you know uh, that's something that a, a skill that uh, especially in the in the arts, media, entertainment industry, you just have to develop the skill to navigate through that. So. Right. Well, I, w- I wasn't necessarily trying to interject that uh, you shouldn't work with white people. I was just saying that. No, no, no. I, I, well, I, I, I understand exactly what you said and and, you know, the. You know what you meant by that, but right. I will say this. I will just say this because I've, I've worked for I worked for a magazine in Lyon City, a black magazine. I worked for a black newspaper. And so sometimes I would say sometimes now I say most of the times. Your black companies may not have uh, the resources or sometimes the money to even compensate you uh, to uh, in terms of what your what your true value is. So that's I'm just saying that uh, that's just kind of a a word of caution in regard to that. And then also sometimes with black people, I know with me coming up, some of the older uh, African Americans that were in business uh, looked at me as a threat, and but that, but I think that that's that, that's a cultural thing that we need to get, get beyond in terms of in terms of trusting each other. So I I just wanted to kind of throw that in. But the most of the stuff that I learned I learned in corporate America, and then yes. I would go, I would also go to to my job every day, just being there to want to observe. And learn as much as I can, so that I can use it for for my own good, you know, in the future. Mm-hmm. Now, um, to to kind of highlight LA Phoenix a little bit, because I, I do know uh-huh. like some some cats from like Watts. Um, right. They went to like a uh, an event that you were doing uh, in LA. Uh-huh. And- I think that, that's how they got interested in and wanting to read the LA Phoenix and want to learn uh-huh. about it. And so you right. know, like. You to even reach people from Watts and you know like Inglewood and back when Inglewood was bad, right. kind of now, but you know Compton and you know places of that right. central, you know that that says something. That that says something. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. And I mean, I, but I, I I like to think of L.A. Phoenix being you know a model and a role model, you know, because um, some of the areas that I think sometimes you know, black youth need to focus on is learning how to, you know, uh, resolve conflict resolution without escalating things. And and what I mean by that is even us fighting among ourselves. And then also, you know, non-lethally, you know, yeah. Um, I I think, I think that's, that's really important. And and I think it's a a lesson to, to learn very early on in life. Uh, you know, because I taught, I taught at Jordan High School, which is in South Central Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and then I were, then I taught for um, the Los Angeles School of Global Studies, which is downtown LA, and and both of those schools were well, uh, well in Watts it was predominantly black and Hispanic, and literally, literally every day there will be fights. Yeah, there'll be fights because oh well he's wearing red today and or he's wearing blue today and 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 and, and then I just wanted to give you one one particular situation where I had this little sixteen year old black girl cuss me out in front of class, but clearly it wasn't necessarily me, but it was just that you could tell how frustrated she was. So mm-hmm. I I so I I called her mother in for a parent conference. She cussed her mother out. Then the mom looking at me like, what am I supposed to do? So I so I think that I'm just saying that to say that oftentimes we as a community need to really um, spend time with our youth. And that's why, you know, education and the youth to me is really important to, to me because they're going to be our future leaders. And yep. we need to teach them how to, um, you know, how to navigate in a hostile world. I mean, yes, I mean, if you're African-American, you live in America, it's not the same if, if you were born white. You yeah. know, you're not going to have the same opportunities. And you're yeah. going to get angry. You're going to get frustrated. 
when I was in my early 20s, I was an angry black man because I, you know, I, I just felt that I, I got a raw deal. But what I did was I took that anger and I refocused it on learning as much as I could, you know, and working as hard as I could and understanding, you know, business, understanding the industry so that I could control my own destiny. I'm not going to wait on some, you know, some, some boss, some art director or mm -hmm. some company uh, for my future security. So, I mean, even with my books, all my books have been self-published because I'm not going to go begging for someone to publish what I want. Right. The narrative and my story. Right. So I, I learned printing. I learned how to design. I learned how to do all those things to um, to publish my own books. Right on. Right on. Y'all hear that? And that is important to control your own narrative. And, you and, and then also, and then also, let me just add this other part to it, too. Then also, you get to monetize. In other words, you get paid for your worth. What's your worth? You know, because you know you're going to work for somebody and you know what they're paying you is, you know, you're, what you're doing is worth more than what they're paying you or they wouldn't, they wouldn't hire you. Yeah. So, so and, and then also having control over my intellectual property. Um, yeah. And I'll give, you, I'll give you a little quick story about that. So when my Phoenix came out, it was, it was, it was very popular, you know. Um, I, I, I did a second printing of it. You know, like maybe a year after it came out, like I said, I was on CNN and I was, you know, just doing my thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at the time, I got approached by a couple of studios. So it was um, Saban. Uh, at the time, Motown had an animation division, Motown Animation, Fox, and New Line Cinema. And so I, I had a couple of meetings with uh, the, the studios. Mm -hmm. And at the time, that, that's when, um, you know, a lot of the comic book characters were, were starting to be made into movies and, and, and television series. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, got, I got a couple of offers, you know. But here's the, here's, the, here's the thing. I mean, they didn't offer me a whole lot of money, and I was just grateful that I was offered something. But mm -hmm. the real... The part that was really important to me was having creative control. Right. And by that, but what I mean by that is I don't want them to take L.A. Phoenix and make him into this ghetto character, you know, right. this stereotypical, you know, ex-gang member or anything like that. Right. And so they would not give me that control because I wanted to be part of that, that control of what that character would be like on the screen or in television. I mean, it's the yeah. reason you got one meteor man because black man is a yeah. It's, it's the yeah. reason one meteor man. That's the one. That's it. So initially, I I was trying to get getting to do, do that Hollywood thing, and then what I did was then I I said, well, you know, forget this. I'm gonna. So I refocused on um, the tales from the kids with the books I did about the kids. I've also done. Uh, anti-smoking book. I've mm. done anti-drug book. I've mm. done historical books. I did a historical book about the Watchtowers Art Center. I did a historical book about um, the West Adams District. Uh, I did a historical book about Central Avenue. Uh, I did a historical book about jazz and how it evolved. So, so instead of you know going after that commercial big dollar movie thing, which is fine. I mean, if I would have got it, I would have been happy about that. Mm -hmm. But to me, it was more about the integrity and uh, doing something positive for my community. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes I don't always pay, but, you know, like, like do the right thing or get paid. You know, I, right. I, would do the, I, would, I would do the right thing. You know, like money, yeah. money don't mean everything to me. You know, like I, I'm gonna make money. Yeah, you're right. Money. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Brown, we are almost out of time. We are almost out oh, of time. Oh, okay. 
Um, but man, listen, listen. This if I would, if I if I would have it, it's gonna be two hours long. But no, um, <laughs> nah. Uh, L.A. Phoenix. Uh, oh, uh, real quick, what are some things that you are uh, working on right now? If you want to uh, shout. Okay. Out? Okay, sure. Okay, so I am working on a best of tales from the kids. Okay. Which is the books I'm talking about with the kids. Yeah. Um, I I. I just, my latest book was Pandemic, Race, and the Media. So that's a, a collection of political cartoons about 2020. And it deals with the pandemic, inequities. And also I have a whole section on the Tulsa Massacre. Are you familiar with the Tulsa Massacre? Of course I'm familiar with the Tulsa Massacre. Okay. So, with the plethora of other massacres that happened during- Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. So. So I actually have a chapter specifically in that book about the Tulsa massacre, and I can send you a link. It's on, that that book's on Amazon. And then I then I, prior to that, I did a book uh, called the Obama Legacy. So it's a book about Obama's eight years in office mm-hmm. and all the challenges that he did in terms of that. And then next this Saturday, I'm going to be at the Taste of Soul, which is sponsored by. The Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper. And that's going to be from 10 to 7 on Crenshaw Boulevard next Saturday, the 15th. I hear that. Any Los Angeles natives? You'll support them. And you can and you can find my cartoons if you, you can go to the Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper online, and there's a link on the menu for cartoons. You can click on that and you'll see my most recent cartoons. Awesome. Um, oh, I'm gonna have to actually. I'm gonna have to actually. Um, I'll, I'll stream. But oh my god, like, um, no, I, I, can, I can actually hear. If somebody wanted to submit a cartoon, uh-huh. or if they wanted to just submit a cartoon, like, uh, like based off a comic book that they had, or just uh-huh. how, they, how, how would they go through that that uh, process? Well, 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 but they can reach out to me. I'm I'm not hard, hard to find. You could. You could just Google David G. Brown uh, cartoonist, and you can find me. Um, I have a website, davidgbrown.studio. And, uh, yeah, just reach out to me. Uh, and probably the easiest thing, maybe just Facebook. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Instagram. You know, I'm on Twitter and, and LinkedIn. So that's probably the most effective way, and quickest way to reach out to me. Right on, right on. Man, Mr. Brown, you'll understand. Like, man, I've been trying to get this interview, and I appreciate you for just giving me the time. Brother, I've learned so much. We've been educated. And uh, just thank you for just uh, just just blessing us with your presence, brother. Like, bro, this, this last uh, three three months have been awesome, dude. Interviews have been rolling. Y'all can always, Great. Check, uh, y'all can always go check out the Respect My Nerds YouTube channel. Um, I post, like, maybe six new interviews, including this uh-huh. one. I got another interview I'm doing on Wednesday and I think I got two potential interviews I have uh I might do tomorrow and Thursday. Uh both both uh, with the black comic book shop owners. So uh that's great. That's, Good. Yeah, it's been beautiful. Well well I'm gonna I'm well I'm going to so is it the blog that you have or what uh YouTube no, 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 it, it just shows you YouTube. so 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna share your YouTube uh channel too. Okay. You said you said the nerds. It's like respect, respect. the nerds. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I say I respect my nerds with a Z. Yeah, because I, I don't think you. I don't think you seen my, uh, my my Facebook group or my. Uh, yeah. No. Well, I, well, well, I'm gonna join. I'm gonna join. So. I don't know how to flip the camera on here, man. It don't. It don't show you how to uh, flip the camera on on uh, Skype. It just. Uh, well, you. Well, I. I don't see you, but I see myself. In uh, you know they have how they have the picture in picture, so I can yep. see myself in the picture in picture. But I I saw you earlier, but now I'm just seeing like it looks like uh, a blurry screen. <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. All right. All right. All, all right, right. But look, Trayvon, I really appreciate you reaching out to me, and I know that uh, we've been playing uh, phone, phone tag, tag over the last couple of months. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but I'm I'm glad that we had a chance to connect and and hopefully my words and my message and the work that I do will be a positive influence on 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 somebody that sees it. Yeah, I hear that. 
man, brother Brown, I'm not worthy. I, I'm not worthy. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> it's, it's a full vessel. Blessed with your presence, brother Brown. We are all out of time. Thank you so much, man. Listen, okay. Y'all go find uh, David G. Brown on social media. Y'all give him a follow. Y'all give him a like. You know what I'm saying? Tell him hello. You know what I'm saying? Uh, on the on, on the posts, not his messages. Only okay. Here. All right, but we're out of time. We're out of here, man. Thank you, Mr. All right. Brown. Take care, brother. All right. I'll right. talk to you. All right. Bye. Bye.